I'm very happy to have the opportunity to join with you in this Holy Week. Uh, uh, we will be talking tonight or together about the resurrection of Jesus. I'd like to begin with a prayer. O God, whose only begotten Son has purchased for us the reward of everlasting life, grant we beseech thee that meditating on this mystery of the resurrection, we may imitate what it contains and obtain what it promises through Christ our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, pray for us. Before we talk about the resurrection tonight, I'd like to talk a little bit first about the person of Jesus himself. Uh, uh, now, Jesus, in becoming man, becoming, being born into this world, he chose to be like us in all things but sin. So Jesus is fully, fully human, and we often forget that. Uh, now, and he was indeed the Son of God, but he never used his divine status to save himself or to protect himself. Uh, he used his divine power only at the service of others to heal them, or to forgive their sins. Now, a question you mightn't have thought about in a way, and that, 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 that is that when Jesus left home at the age of 30 and began his ministry in Galilee, uh, did he have a plan? <laughs> did he have a plan how he would, what he was going to do, how he was going to spend his time and so? Or did he just say, well, I'll go about doing good and teaching the people and see what happens? No. I think we can indeed say, as any thoughtful person would in, in, in launching a new project, that he had thought it out very carefully and had, had a strategy, had a plan in mind. Uh, now, the central thing in the life of Jesus uh, was the, his relationship with his Father in heaven. Now, he had this extraordinary loving, intimate relationship with him. He, he called him Abba the kind of the name a child would call his father in Palestine in those days, Abba, like Daddy or Dad. Uh, and he uh, recognized this God as incredibly loving and good. <laughs> and this was a God who made the sun to shine and the rain to fall for everybody, good and bad alike. This God was like the, the, the father or the, the man who puts on a party and invites everybody, tell them all to come to the party. This God is like the father whose son goes off out, spends his, wastes his property, comes home in rags, and the father sees him coming. While he's still a long way off, the father saw him, he ran to him, clasped him in his arm, and kissed him tenderly. Uh, and then, in not a word of reproach, and they put on a party with music and dancing. Now, Jesus saw that if this loving God was allowed to rule people's lives as families, as communities, as country, as world. If this God was allowed to rule their lives, the world would be extremely different. That there would be peace. Four different kinds of peace, in a sense. There would be people would be at peace with God. People would be at peace with one another. People would be at peace within their own selves and people would be at peace with creation. Um, so, uh, now, this was what he called the rule of God, or the kingdom of God. And Jesus saw that his vocation, his calling in life, was to bring about the rule of this incredibly loving God that would touch all aspects of human life in the family, in the community, in the world. And that was his vocation. Now, when he looked around the country he was living in, he saw that things were very far from the kingdom of God, God ruling. Poor people were neglected. Uh, many people were judged sinners and therefore were excluded. Uh, heavy burdens were placed on people in the name of religion. And people were harassed and dejected, as he said, like sheep without a shepherd. Now, here comes the question of planning. Now, Jesus made practical decisions about what he would actually do. Now, uh, for example, he did not go to the religious authorities in Jerusalem and try to win them over. 
Or he didn't go to the influential people in Galilee and try to get them on his side. No. He went to people on the outside, ordinary people, poor people, people that were classed as sinners and outcasts. And he told them what God was like. And he showed them by the way he behaved and how he treated them what God was like. No. Uh, and he went among them as a friend and a brother, never patronizing them. Uh, he cured the sick and he reconciled sinners. But he sat and ate with them. He recognized their goodness and he praised it. The woman who was, had the bad name in the town and came and anointed his feet, he said, she showed great love. No. And often he gave the credit for the miracles to the faith of the people that he cured. Your faith has saved you. Now, among his followers, Jesus chose a small group of people, 12 first of all, and later on he sent out 72. And he took great care in teaching them. Jesus spent an enormous amount of time teaching the general, the crowd of people, and this particular group especially. Uh, he wanted them to understand his message, to live it, and then be able to spread it out to other people. Well, for a time, all went well. Huge crowds came. They were attracted by his miracles, and they loved to hear him speaking. Uh, uh, now, but then he began to get into trouble with the religious authorities. Uh, when they saw, or whenever Jesus saw, the religious rules uh, oppressing people, making life an extra burden for them, he would break those rules quite deliberately. Uh, when somebody needed to be cured on the Sabbath day, Jesus never said, look, we'll come back tomorrow. No, the loving Father will cure them today, and Jesus would cure them. Uh, so so the, 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 the Pharisees said, you don't mix with sinners, because if you do, you'll become as bad as they are yourselves. But Jesus mixed with them. He sat down, he ate with them. Uh, when Jesus saw the traders in the temple, he didn't say, well, look, I have no authority around here and the chief priests and so I would get upset. He got angry and he cleared them out. You don't turn my father's house into a market. Well, opposition grew. And Jesus saw that he would have to either give up his work or go up to Jerusalem and face the people in charge. Uh, and he had set out to bring about the rule of his loving father by teaching and by invitation and by persuading. But now he realized that was not going to work. And now he's conscious of uh, a different calling that he has now, is that the, the, he'll bring about the rule of God, not by the people uh, changing their minds, but by giving his life for them. Uh, the, 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 the. Now, and he would have been aware, very much aware, as he was in the scriptures, of course, about the suffering servant in the prophet Isaiah. And that became a description now of what he saw was before him. And that's why the, the lovely verses, Ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. He was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace. And through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way. And the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Now, at his trial, Jesus acknowledged that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. And this convinced the uh, authorities, religious authorities, that he was blaspheming and justified them putting him to death. When Jesus was on the cross, the leader scoffed at him. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God. The soldiers mocked him in the same vein. If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now what is very striking is that in one sense on the cross, Jesus had no power. No power. He had no military power. He had no political power. His physical strength was gone. And yet Jesus on the cross had a remarkable power that, would, that he would give to his followers to bring out into the world and to change the world. And that was he had the power of love. He had the power of courage. He had the power of patience, endurance, trust in his Father, hope against hope. And that was the kind of power 
that Jesus was convinced would change the world and would save the world. So that's a little word about Jesus himself. And we took now to the resurrection. When it, when it was evening on that first day of the week, the doors of the house were, uh, where the disciples had met were closed for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And he said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now imagine the range of feelings in that room that night. At the beginning, the doors were closed and they were terrified of the Jews that they would do to them what they did to Jesus, that they would arrest them and crucify them. They were very terrified. They had an enormous sense of grief that Jesus, whom they loved, had died, was dead. They had a sense of hopelessness. Everything they hoped for was gone now. There was, of course, also a great sense of shame and guilt. Uh, Judas had betrayed him, Peter had denied him, and the rest of them, they ran away. They ran away. Then Jesus appeared, and first, of course, there was astonishment. Astonishment. And then there was joy. The disciples were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And then his first words to them took them by surprise again. Peace, peace be with you. No word of criticism, no word of complaint, just peace be with you. He assured them of reconciliation first of all. Then he goes, and it went down to business fairly quickly in a sense. It is well now, he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. So he's giving them a task right away. And he breathed on them. Now, so he's breathing, receive the Holy Spirit, he says. Those who sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Now from the beginning, Jesus was described as the one who would come to save his people and save them from their sins. So now this group of people had been given the authority to continue to the work of Jesus. You go out into the world now and you forgive people's sins. You reconcile them with God, with one another, with themselves, and you give them peace. So there right away, they get, they get their calling. During the Easter season, you might like to read the, uh, the, the stories of the resurrection in the four Gospels. Now, they're written by four different inspired writers at different times, and sometimes the details are, are, are contradict each other in small ways, but always each, each Gospel story is giving us a glimpse of Jesus, the risen Lord. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, one of the lovely ones, to mention, one of the most, most attractive in the way is, is Mary Magdalene. She is at the tomb when everybody is gone. She is there weeping. And then Jesus comes and disappears. She doesn't recognize him. She thinks he's the gardener. So she asks him to show him where they put the body of Jesus, and she'll take it away. And then Jesus calls her by name Mary. Now, the extraordinary touching moment, it is when he calls her by name that she recognizes him. <laughs> so that's the risen, the risen Lord. Uh, the the, the the, the story on the road to Emmaus and the Jewish gospel also one of the most lovely stories in the whole Bible. Uh, the two disciples are giving up. <laughs> Everything is lost. They're going home. They're leaving Jerusalem. And then Jesus comes along and walks beside them. They don't recognize him. He walks beside them and uh, he says, what are you talking about? <laughs> now, the extraordinary answer was said that you must be the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what was happening here these last few days. <laughs> and he says to them, in all innocence, well, what things? And then they give him a long account of all that had happened with Jesus, what they had hoped for, and everything has fallen apart, and they're giving up. And then he says to them, ah, you got it wrong. He said, got it wrong. Didn't you realize that the full message of the scriptures had to be fulfilled? And then he goes on then to take them through the story of the Old Testament, all the things that are in there about the Messiah, that far from being a Messiah that would be a glorious king with great political power and so on, that the Messiah would have to suffer. 
uh, before he would enter into glory. And then when they arrive in Emmaus, they ask him to come in with them, they persuade him, and in the breaking of bread, they recognize it is Jesus. So that, 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 that beautiful, beautiful story. And then, of course, straight away, they turn back. <laughs> we don't have to give up at all. They go back to Jerusalem. Now, there's an aspect of the resurrection I'd like to, to, to invite you to, 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 to look carefully at, and it's one that can escape us almost completely, and it's something enormously powerful. Now, St. Paul was one of the people that gave great emphasis on this, and that is that there is a very close connection between our lives and the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, we're talking about our lives being lived today, the connection between that and the death and resurrection of Jesus in Nazareth, or in, in Bethlehem, in Jerusalem, uh, more than 2,000 years ago. Now, St. Paul puts it very dramatically. He says, always, wherever we may be, we carry with us in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus, too, may be seen in our body. <laughs> he goes on. Indeed, while we are still alive, we are consigned to our death every day for the sake of Jesus. So that in our flesh, the life of Jesus, that's the resurrected life of Jesus, too, may be openly shown. Now, uh, if you lived in the early Christian uh, century, that is, uh, years, uh, you would, uh, uh, the connection between, the, between your life and the death and resurrection would be, would be much clearer, I think, than it is for us today. Uh, now, imagine you're living in the first century, and suppose you had grown up in a pagan world, and you, you lived a life of selfishness and greed and dishonesty and immorality, not the thought of God in your mind. And then you came to know some dedicated Christians, and they, they impressed you deeply, and then you were moved uh, to, to join them. I joined those people. So through the autumn and the winter, you would be instructed in the faith, and then you would present yourself with several other people who were on the same track with yourself for baptism at the Vigil Mass on the Easter Saturday night. Now, so now in the middle of that ceremony, you would be immersed in baptismal water in a large container, dipped down up to, the, up to your neck in cold water. <laughs> now that would make an impact. <laughs> and, uh, and you would be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And uh, in that moment, you are sharing, in a symbolic way, in the death of Jesus, as if you had gone down into the tomb with Jesus himself, as St. Paul says. So it was like dying. So, and in the cold water, you were it was like dying. And, and, and you were dying to everything that had been wrong and sinful in your life, and finished with that now, I'm dead to that now. Then you came up out of the water, and you dressed in a new white robe, like Jesus risen from the dead. <laughs> that's the new, that's the resurrection. And you'd begin a whole new life of living uh, in, a, in a virtuous and good way. Now, every year at the uh, in Easter Vigil, we renew our baptismal promises. Now, we renounce Satan and all that's sinful and finish with that and burying that. And then we profess our faith in the Father who created us in Jesus who saved us, and in the Holy Spirit who makes us holy. So we share in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus uh, when we die to sin, that is, we give up all sin, at, often at a high cost indeed, and then we live a new life of goodness. Now, so that's one way in which we share uh, in, the, in the, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now there's another one, a simpler one in a way, and that is to say that we all share in the resurrection of Jesus in a sense that we all experience crucifixion in small ways and sometimes in quite big ways. Now, in our suffering, we share in the suffering and death of Jesus. St. Paul says, with Christ I am nailed to the cross. Now, St. Paul was not crucified, he was just having a very hard time. With Christ I am nailed to the cross. But the crucifixion is not the whole story of our lives. We also live his new life of resurrection. Uh, so for example, when we carry our cross with patience and courage, there is new life, there is resurrection. The cross is still there, and yet the way we carry it and deal with it, there is resurrection. Now in St. John's account of the Passion, 
Jesus' glory and victory were to be seen, not just in the resurrection, but actually within the passion itself. Now, on Holy Thursday night, when Judas left the supper table and went out, and it was dark, that was an extremely low moment. And that was when Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified. In other words, already before the resurrection, Jesus is glorified. And he's glorified by the way he faces into death and his suffering and the way he shows the, the, how, the, the full extent of his love. He showed that in his passion so that his, his resurrection is visible within the passion itself, not only when he rose from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. Uh, now, the glory is seen. He showed the full extent of his love. Now, as you think about the cross that you carried, or the cross you're carrying right now, you might ask yourself, where is the glory? Where is the resurrection? And you might think of your patience, your courage, your endurance, your creativity, your spirit of forgiveness. You might say, you know, I never thought I could deal with all of this. And you may find then that you are indeed not only living the crucifixion of Jesus, but you're living his resurrection and new life. And that's no small thing. Finally, in the last little section, I'd like to talk about the presence of the risen Jesus today. Jesus risen. Now, where is the risen Jesus now? Well, he's at the right hand of the Father. And that's how wonderful that is, of course. Jesus rewarded for the incredible love and generosity of his whole life. He's enjoy rejoying, enjoying the company of his Father in heaven. It's the right hand of the Father. He's in the Eucharist. We're so conscious of Jesus, his real presence in the Eucharist. Body and blood, soul and divinity, as we say. He's in the liturgy, for example, in the liturgy of the word Jesus speaks to us. And Jesus is in ourselves, in ourselves. Now, at the Last Supper, in St. John's Gospel, Jesus says, I will not leave you orphans, I will come back to you. In a short while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live and you will live. On that day you will understand that I am in my Father, you are in me and I am in you. Now notice that phrase now. On that day you will understand that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Uh, St. Paul says, well, with the first while ago I said that I have been crucified. He said I have been crucified with Christ and yet I am alive. Yet it is no longer I but Christ living in me. Paul aware of the risen Jesus living within himself. Now, during his 33 years in, in the Holy Land, Jesus was limited to one small country. Now he has, he has access to every human being on the planet. <laughs> now, in the Holy Land, when he was there with his disciples, he taught them. But he could not enter into their personalities. He could only change, or he couldn't, certainly couldn't change them from, with, from within. Now, now, he is within his followers. Jesus within his followers. Uh, now, and he is within us in two ways. Be patient with this now, it is very precious. One is that, uh, that, I, uh, that I go into my heart and I speak to Jesus there, the two of us. Uh, and I, yes, he says, make your home in me as I make my home in me. I am there with Jesus, my friend. Now, there's another way in which, we to look at it, that in my heart there is only one. There is Jesus in me and I in Jesus. We are one, not two. Not two. Now we can think about that. Uh, the, the, the result is that when I do something good, it is Jesus in me and I in Jesus. Not two people doing it, but one. <laughs> so, so one agent, as you might say. He in me and I in him. So when you think of something good you have done, you help somebody, you are patient with a difficult person, you forgave somebody, you put up with suffering, you stood up for justice. Who was really doing this? Was it you or was it Jesus? <laughs> and the answer is, it was you in Jesus and Jesus in you. That's a lovely thought, lovely thought. Now, sometimes we ask, if Jesus was in the world today, what would he do? <laughs> now, it's the wrong question because the fact is Jesus is in the world today. So the question is, it's not what would he do, but what is he doing? What did he do 2,000 years ago? Uh, we ponder that. And to recognize what we are doing now, say we ponder and pray over that. So in the prayer for reading of the Gospels, 
we read of something Jesus did long ago, and it reminds us of something similar that's happening now. Say, ah, there's Jesus at work today. Uh, and I'm recognizing the presence of Jesus. But uh, two very dramatic examples, uh, a couple, maybe, maybe three years ago now, the 21 Egyptian working men who were massacred and, and, and put to death on a beach in Libya by ISIS terrorists. 21 of them. <laughs> Now, they came from a small Coptic Christian community, an Egypt minority group, but very close together, bound together with a religious culture, and everyone they stood their ground, and they, they died with the, 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 with the phrase, Oh, my Lord Jesus, on their lips. A young Nigerian girl, one of uh, um, several girls abducted by, by, by the Boko Haram in uh, Nigeria, uh, when the others were being released, they demanded that she disown her Christian faith and they wouldn't let her go. And she said, I can't do that, 15 years old. And as far as I know, she's still in captivity three years afterwards. So there's the, the extraordinary example, Jesus living in people today in a dramatic way. Now, usually we're dealing with smaller examples. Uh, the, I was sick and you visited me and so on. And uh, you might like to, to, to give some thought to that where you experience Jesus in you and you in Jesus in the good things that you do. I'd like to finish with a little prayer, and I leave this with you, and if it's, 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 it, it gathers together so much of the presence of Jesus in, in, in the, the risen Jesus, and that little, this little phrase, live, Jesus, live, live. So live in me, that all I do be done by thee, and grant that all I think and say may be your thoughts and words this day. Amen.